of homage to uh, Seamus Haney, who is, uh, all his life has always made sure <clears throat> that he translated ancient poems, even though, he, of course, he had enough of his own to deal with it. So uh, this is Sweeney Astray. It's an autographed copy. I gave it to me today, which is very kind of him. And I'll just uh, read one verse. Erin, daughter of Khan of Connect, tried to hold him by his cloak. Erin has my blessing for this, but Sweeney lives under my curse. And then I discovered Frederick uh, many, many years ago. I guess in 1994, this was the Frederick County Poetry. There used to be something called the County Poetry Group, which I don't know if they're still around, but uh, they gave me, uh, that's how I first found out this place was here. Uh, second prize in this thing, and it's a poem called The Clown and the Elephant Trainer. And it, the first part is a quote from National Public Radio, which is true. I heard this in the way of work, and it led to the poem itself. The quote is this. Authority stated the circus train accident yesterday in Lakeland, Florida, in which a clown and an elephant trainer were killed, was not the result of sabotage. They are looking into other possible causes. January 14, 1943. I'm sorry, 1994. The clown sneers at the elephant trainer's threat. He has heard worse threats over the years. Once he threatened to throw acid in his wife's face. Another time to make his children toe jelly under the elephant's feet. Even though he does not get the desired reaction, the elephant trainer repeats his threat. You're on notice. You will take that back. The clown, who feels he is far superior to the elephant trainer, wants to play. So he grabs his crotch shakes it and laughs. With that final act of mocking by the clown, the elephant trainer makes his threat good. He repeats in order his elephants know well. To the left, my children. To the left. The train lunges and jumps in the track. Tons of steel and people and animals fly through the air in an act that practice cannot imitate. The elephant trainer sees as he flies that he and the clown are going to be pinned under the weight of the elephants and die immediately. He takes one last look at the clown. The clown tips his hat midair and whispers, why weren't you this good all these years when we were performing in the ring with me, my friend? Both laugh ecstatically as the elephants rain down on them. <laughs> one year later, the half million dollar U.S. government study into the causes of the 1-1593 Lackman circus train accident concludes all evidence indicates that improper track repair and maintenance due to inadequate funding led to this train disaster. Recommendation? Another $5 billion to upgrade the National Rail Network to avoid a repeat of this disaster in the future. <laughs> it's a, a group, they were wonderful, the, the Federal Poets of D.C. Uh, belonged to them for probably 12 years. the uh, second transition. Her eye cut, cerulean blue, isolated, sits below ebony eyebrows, closely observes. A stone and mortar cross-shaped church cut cleanly into the side of a red clay mesa. Montezuma's castle, a gentle Indian tribe that disappeared mysteriously from the lush green valley, valley when the British defeated Les Canadiens on the plains of Abraham. Desert green, a 300-year-old saguaro is slashed by the steel bumper of a freshly machined truck, family, factory air-conditioned, teenager-owned. Her eye cut cerulean blue surveys the damage, apologizes to God, apologizes to the Indians, apologizes to nature. She tires of man's rule and ingathers the women, wonders if the time is right, wonders if the women will rule it better. Wonders how she ever allowed evolution to go so haywire. Sees the mistake of allowing man his laws, his religions, his wanderings. Ever aware of the children, decides on instinct, conscious of love, and continues to procreate. There are years to repair the damage as there were years to allow it. Centuries to transmit new genetic codes reborn as there were centuries to allow their neglect. Her eye cut cerulean blue, isolated, sits below ebony eyebrows. 
closely observes the second transition. This is uh, Christmas, it's kind of a, a Christmas theme. Walking on pine needles. Soft brown earth cover reminding one and all, God the Father in heaven by the tree conquered the fall. The blind can see. The blind can see with hands, their eyes, things far too real for you or I. They see without the aid of sight, better what's wrong, better what's right. So pass them by at your own risk, in silken fog and clearer mist. Find their eyes, study their ways, only then to know richer, fuller days. Ray Will bordering on black. Uh, again, it's a quote from a newspaper article. In Mansfield, Ohio, a 74-year-old man froze to death after his Ohio Edison Company shut off power to his home because he had not paid an $18 electric bill. In the summer, he sweeps once more the worn sidewalks, makes a few meals when the checks arrive, and yells occasionally at the neighborhood kids who call him nasty names. In the winter, he stares blankly out the front window, realizing he only exists in the memory of a few living friends, he feels the chill getting worse, and dies. So, for anybody that's uh, married out there with kids, I guess, it's a poem called Coffee Money, you need to understand. Despite the pre cana classes, despite the best advice of friends, despite an industry devoted to it, let me tell you, friend, this basic truth. Coffee money will save your marriage every time. Every Friday, I take the $100 bills and place them under the coffee can, where my wife takes them and spends them on all the bills that accumulate in this family. Coffee money will save a marriage every time. So no matter what poetry may tell you of love, and no matter those fancy $1,000 relationship classes, if you really want your marriage to last more than the wedding day, go to the store and buy a tin of coffee. Even if you don't drink it, coffee money will save your marriage every time. <laughs> Coyote from then. Coyote's lament. Honey, this woman had her tongue in his ear, one hand in his hair, another God knows where, and they were speeding down I-270 in a massive Jeep going 80 miles an hour. For shame. For shame. Why doesn't that happen to us anymore? Oh, they're probably not married, she replied, as if that answered it. Who knows if they were married? The point is, think about what I said. Her tongue was in his ear. Her one hand was in his hair, and the other hand, well, it could have been anywhere. And they were speeding down the highway. Now that's living, I said, turning over sideways. Dreaming of highways and freedom and excitement and love out of whack with all sense of propriety. Like I said, they probably weren't married, she said again, as if it answered anything. Outside, a coyote called to a jackal loudly, while the jackal ignored the coyote's call. But ah, the moon's bright tonight. Just the kind of moon a coyote might use to guide him to the highway. Midnight Milk Run. Ladies, Beware of men too willing to go for a gallon of milk at night. Such time allows copious amounts of time to hand the bookie or the dope dealer or the other woman 
or any number of temptations, family money, or the path to your man's heart. So when he returns with a gallon of milk, always check it twice. Once to make sure all the cream hasn't been skimmed from the top, and once to make absolutely sure both he and the milk are still pure and white. The Splendid Routine. It is in the routine life is mastered, not the spectacular or heady. It is a sandwich made again and again to the same perfection that feeds the millions. The two by four placed in the same position as a thousand times before that builds the house for millions. The prayer prayed with humble precision that reaches the ear of God. So despite the media feeding frenzy, the 15 minutes of fame, the opening night glory, the awarders giving each other awards in Hollywood's special desperation, or the worship of the crowd in the stands at the sports cathedral's ritual of discipline and moxie granting blessing and benediction. The same crowd that worships has a cadre underneath the stands fashioning the crown of thorns and preparing the cross and nails. It is in the routine that done well, the family life rewards and the world ignores that generations continue. Leave the more heady moments to the world. Home to the scholars of these poems. Remember this, if nothing else, of my poetry. Before making your students suffer reading or studying or reciting them, know this. When I wrote them, all of them, at that three to five minutes I was happier than a man has a right to be in this life because I glimpsed the next. When you study these poems, that transparent moment of light, that moment I knew when the poem was given to me on the back of an angel's wings, should also be taught. It was far more pleasure than pain. Ignore the ordinary rewriting and the editor's cruel rejections and the fool, drunk with pride and the self-satisfied satisfied learning of the Sadducees and Pharisees of higher, higher learning. And even if you mock the ideas as you retell it, still tell it. Because the holy angels have spoken to me since grade school in my heart, and then departed when I begged them to stay. Like a love lived fully for a moment, such words burn more fiery because their memory lingers in the embers of knowing that metaphysical reality is only one way and not the best way of approaching this life. When this is fully understood, it will be William Butler Yeats' bedside poems to study and the world infused with light. Before I uh, did the South Beach diet, uh, I was allowed to eat cream donuts. And uh, they're wonderful for uh, quick, a quick way to get past depression. And uh, I think this reflects that sentiment. Cream donut. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's filled with enough milk and butter and sugar to meet the needs of a small country for a year. And I know it's loaded with enough cholesterol to kill eight rats in a drug company lab. And I know its sugar dose is large enough to meet any alcoholic's weekly sugar addiction. But if you're ever suicidal, try a cream donut. Treat yourself to its buddy, Donut Shop Sugar Coffee, too. As sugar endorphins careen through your gray matter and thoughts of suicide wither on the brain by, your newly functioning and newly appreciated brain will remind you a cigar may be just a cigar, but a cream donut and sugar coffee can save your life. Weiss family has an orchard in West Virginia where they grow apples and peaches and cherries and plums and uh, it's a hard life. 
and that's a pretty basic thing to watch. And this is part of a much larger poem, but uh, and the two uh, verses here I think convey what they're they go through. It's called the fruit of the orchard. In harvest, the feast is set before the orchard family's spare table. The families of apples dance a buffet, a ballet of sweet nourishment. Applesauce sweet rich from the goldens and johnnies and grannies fill the bowl. Honey-colored apple juice is poured. The new baby is fed diced yorks. Cinnamon and sugar explode on her tongue. And the fruits of labor, human and divine. And that very feeding from father to daughter and from mother to son ensure again the continuance of the eternal plan. I guess I've been married almost uh, 25 years, and uh, anybody that's married or in a deep relationship gets into the swale, which is uh, what this poem is about. Unfortunately, it doesn't last long. <clears throat> the swale. Into this swale we walk word by word, sentence by sentence, silence by silence, until knee deep in mud we try to exit for dry land, only to hear the sucking sound of swamp bottom on boots that render escape impossible alone. But together, we can struggle to safety, to love, to caring enough to stop this mad descent into fighting and angry words and the deaths that follow these silences. Here, here, my love, I cry. Where? Where, you answer, until all I hear is mud and all I see is the dead fruits of false pride and real anger. This is uh, one of my favorites because it's, uh, Hank and I both grew up in Philadelphia and uh, diners are pretty special places. So hopefully this uh, conveys some of that feeling. At the diner, when the waitress says, what will it be, hon? She knows what it will be, but she's still asking. and you still reply, usual, number three. You know it will be as good as before, and lickety split, three stacks of wheat pancakes, golden brown and fluffy appear, upon which you drop a half stick of butter and a carafe of syrup with marble-sized blueberries inside, and toasted scrapple, and easy over country eggs with buttered toast, before shoveling in the Pennsylvania Dutch scrapple with Heinz 57 varieties ketchup as a roof on top. As the first juicy pancake slice slides down your throat to your famished stomach, you start to hear Frank Sinatra's strangers in the night, and it seems as if love were possible. Right here, right now, maybe you and the waitress or the girl much younger than you in that booth with the unjilted smile and the honey hair, she might consider you, yes, you and her life, dreams and future. At the diner, so many memories crash through the mind's creeping depression to reveal cracks in the thick walls of melancholia and op openings where light and therapy from waitresses who double as mothers and nurses bringing hearty good food to souls who, due to life's machinations, often forget to eat. But here, love, hope, and tragedy, faith, broken lives, and buckets of warm coffee, but most importantly, fast and cheap good food all mingle in cosmic proportion to the big tipping customers and the life-giving waitresses who pass their moments in space and time, co-mingled in experience of talk and talk and food and drink, and you, who could not talk when you first came in here, now chatter and diner talk, where no one judges or evaluates the context and everyone shares the word. At the diner, so easily and languidly the mind drifts, and my father sits in a booth over there. I am five. And we have stopped for lunch in, this, in the middle of his beer truck delivery run. And I have his undivided attention, one of the few times that would ever happen. And he is regaling me with stories of his childhood, of how during the Depression he had to go to school with orange shoes his mother bought cheap and put black shoe polish on, except it rained and washed the shoe polish off. And all the kids laughed at him. And he was so embarrassed that even as a kid he always worked two jobs so he could have four good clothes. And the time they rolled so many old tires down the street, they were able to hold off a squadron of police officers only to find they knew their parents and they returned home thinking they got away with murder. 
and the parents were on the doorstep waiting for them to give them a licking because the police, who belonged to the same parish, had visited before and tipped off their parents to do the punishing. At the diner in another booth, Tony Fondot and I have stopped at the, at the Circle Diner in southern New Jersey, coming back from the shore and young and drunk and laughing and goofing with all the young girls who respond, I have my doubts about you, fond doubts, and a play on Tony's name. And we all begin to laugh as hard and the tears run down our cheeks. And this is way before a guy who didn't like government employees saw Tony head on a Postal Service shirt and tossed him from a bridge, a bridge in Norristown, Pennsylvania, causing his pelvis to fracture in 186 places. And then got off because his dad was able to afford a better and slicker lawyer than Tony's and offered the, this wisdom afterwards. Why do you think it's called the criminal justice system? It's justice for the criminals. At the diner, in another booth, my body is old and spent like that guy at the end of the movie 2001 and does not respond too well to stimuli like talk or thought. But the food warms my mouth and stomach. The coffee is good and hot. The waitress is kind and funny and ignores my drawing on my plate. Pancakes fill my hunger just before my heart stops its power, plant, strength, contractions, and it's all over. Or so I thought. Until at Heaven's Gate, I'm hungry and tired for too many years on the road, and stop at this diner where St. Bridget immediately brings me ice water and hot coffee, winks and says, what'll it be, hon? And I wink back and say, the usual, number three, pancakes and scrapple. And another cup of java, please? And she smiles back and says, you betcha. It just so happens I brewed another one because I knew you were, I was expecting you, hun. And we both laugh in the diner and let the tears run down our cheeks to bring water and love and strength to all the diner customers on earth. This is a, a true story. I've read this before. It's uh, called The Kind of Woman to Marry. And uh, what's told in here is accurate. My poor wife. The kind of woman to marry. Dear Josh and Eamon, we didn't go to the islands or Paris on our honeymoon. We went to Cape May, New Jersey, where the proprietor of a bed and breakfast refused to give us shelter because we arrived at 3 a.m. after an all-night drive. The first night, we slept on the beach by the nun's convent near the lighthouse. It was freezing. And my new bride, your mother, and I clung to each other for warmth. Since that night, many others have slammed doors in our faces. Always we clung to each other near the outgoing tide and laughed with each sunrise after the cold, harsh night. So marry a woman like that, one like your mother, one who shelters you from the cold and dark, both human and nature. Love, Dad. Eamon's poem. Kicking your mother from inside the liquid universe of the womb, I feel so crushed and broken when considering I have so much to teach you and only the remaining lifetime to do so. It is hopeless, really. Except these two gems that came down from a long, long line of men and women who survived centuries of Viking invasions, whose barbarity was only surpassed by the neighbor invader, who considered genocide by the rule of law such a jolly good adventure, and stole all the food in the very middle of the famine of all famines. Through it all, your ancestors survived, tenaciously creative, and green as moss on the back of a stone on the gentle Shannon River. And these two gems skip across that great river to the Delaware, where once, when wondering of ancestral roots, I asked my father, Dad, what is it to be an American? Work. What? I asked. Work, he repeated. Your grandfather worked, I worked, you'll work. That's all? That's all, he answered. Then what is it to be Irish? Hilarity. He didn't skip a beat again. Hilarity. you got to make them laugh. So there it is, Amos Patrick. If God takes me before I get to teach you all you need to know, let these two words su suffice. Work and hilarity. Work and hilarity 
saved our people over centuries of warfare, pestilence, invasion, slavery, defeat, and famine, and eventually defeated the greatest power on earth so that I could write you this poem. Work and hilarity can carry you to the universe and to the other planets. And when you find a particularly hard planet, name it Work. And when you find an especially funny planet, name it Hilarity. No matter what the planet or year, work and hilarity are in your genes, as am I and all my dreams. Academics that destroy the love of poetry that we 